podcast. Here we go. Hello, hello, Sammy. Today we're talking about perfectionism around the block and where? Around the world, baby. That's where we're going. This is where we discuss, debate, and deliberate all things diabetes. Hopefully we'll just discuss today. Representing type two, my name, Dobie Maxwell. Representing type one, always the vivacious, effervescent, and always in the know, Ms. Sammy Parker. Not shiz, Ms. Today's episode of JMT <laughs> brought to you by the Diabetes app. What is it, Sammy? A free social media app that brings together type 1 and type 2 diabetics. And you can find me and Dobie on the Diabetes app. What Sammy said. Sammy, we're always excited when we have guests on. It's fun to talk to you, but we have an especially, how can I say this in a friendly way, eclectic unusual and dynamic guest. I'm looking forward to talking to this young lady because she's very interesting. Dobby, you have some great adjectives and I'm thinking I'm going to start coming to you to describe I went to high done. school, young lady. I went in the old hey, days. Well, we well, had to we'll walk uphill. I did too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, today we have Miss Valerie. Hello, Valerie. Hi, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to chat with you guys today about diabetes. I know. We are very excited to hear your story because like Dobie said, it's eclectic, it's unusual, and it's, did you say dynamic? Dynamic, it is. We talked a little bit before that. We don't always get a chance to visit with our guests. Sometimes they just kind of come on. And uh, your story was mesmerizing. So I'm going to shut my mouth and get to you. Could you maybe share with us your diagnosis story so we can get out, started out that way? Yeah. So I was 10 when I was diagnosed with diabetes. And I want to just give a little story leading up to it that I think personifies what really happened. I was in fifth grade and we were, I lived in Illinois and we were on a field trip to downtown Chicago. And, you know, imagine these two huge yellow school buses filled with fifth graders. And we had left the museum and we were going back to our school an hour away. And about 10 minutes into the journey, I realized I have to go to the bathroom And it's not like I have to go to the bathroom and I can hold it for an hour. It's I have to go to the bathroom and I have to go now. So in my little fifth grade brain, I'm thinking, do I wet my pants? There's no bathroom on the bus. Do I tell a teacher? But then everybody on the bus is going to know that I had to stop. And I decided to ultimately choose that route. They had to find a place for two buses to stop in downtown Chicago so a teacher could take me into a hotel and use the bathroom. And I have bathroom issues ever since. Like I literally plan, oh, okay, I can't drink so much. And it's crazy how those, you know, the diagnosis of diabetes really illuminated why I had to go to the bathroom all the time because I was literally drinking so much water and always having to use the restroom. But after that, my mom took me to the doctor for my fifth grade physical. He looked at my chart and my blood sugar numbers and said, you need to go to the hospital today, young lady. And that was the beginning of my journey. Now, as a, as a child, now Sammy was a kid too when she got diagnosed. I was in my 40s when I did. And it, it freaked me out. I can't believe a kid doesn't get absolutely, oh my gosh, this is beyond my comprehension. It's a death sentence, I'm afraid. This is worse than the boogeyman. You know, I think it was worse on my parents because I didn't know what I didn't know. So I was very worried once I was, you know, in the hospital and learning to take shots on an orange and being told you can eat one fruit exchange and one bread exchange and one fat, one protein, and you have to follow this meal plan. And if you don't, you could die. And and that's pretty scary as a kid of any age, I guess. Especially as a kid. Yeah. You don't see that on Disney. You know, no. d- die? What? No, it's stressful because I said, I mean, it makes you have thicker skin, but it's a lot. And it's um, your worries and priorities are very different than an average kid. Yeah. And I don't know, Sammy, if you felt this, but I felt like I was a pretty normal, content, happy kid before. And then I was diagnosed and I was suddenly really worried. I was micromanaging on myself. The seeds of my perfectionism definitely blossomed with getting diabetes because you feel like every decision you make has significant consequences. Yeah, I'm a perfectionist too. And so it's kind of weird because it's not to the extent of like uh, my blood sugar had to be perfect. Like I always had, I had like majorly highs and lows and whatnot. But in terms of like the perfectionism of like, I have to be able to do everything and I had to be well balanced. There was never a time that I could just like lay down at home. Like if my blood sugar was high, it was, didn't phase me if it went up. But if it went up, I was like, okay, I'm going to work out. And they're like, Smith, that's fine. Like just 
rest and let it go down. I'm like, nope, determined. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> so it would be like, that was just my personality and still is that way with a lot of things. But it can be really tricky because you can get inside your own head very easily. And like Doby, he's made the habit of walking. So he's on day 80. Like for me, my, my perfectionism would be there and I would be like, can't miss the day, have to go, need to go now. Like if I miss the day, I'm screwing up, you know? And so that's kind of where that can be like tricky because it can just tweak in your brain and you're like, ah, you know? So, Valerie, if you don't mind, let's talk about perfectionism a little bit. I know you wrote a book and it's, I am not that. And again, I, I try to be open-minded, but you now Sammy talks about that too. Is I, I'm not a perfectionist. I'm an improvementist. <laughs> if I, I, I teach comedy classes. And I tell my students, again, I don't want you to be perfect. I want you to improve all the time. And there's not, I don't think there's a right or wrong, but it's how we are. So tell us about your book and how you have perfectionism in your life. Sure. Well, I now describe myself as a recovering perfectionist because through my story, through my journey, I realized that perfectionism wasn't really serving me. So my book is called Off Script, A Mom's Journey Through Adoption, A Husband's Alcoholism, and Special Needs Parenting. And you note that diabetes isn't in the title, but diabetes definitely played a role in my journey overlaid with all those other kind of stressful, demanding topics. And so perfectionism as a diabetic, you know, I really wanted to have the perfect blood sugars. I kept detailed records, carbs, fats, all the macros, exercise. What are the trends? Da, da, da. You know, and I started out, I was on two shots a day. And back in the olden days, I've had diabetes for 42 years. So wow, um, my life now on a CGM and an insulin pump is significantly different and more freeing than it was back then. But I think it's one of those topics that you don't hear about, you don't have conversations about at your doctor's office. How are you doing? How's your mental health? Is this disease placing more pressure on you than it needs to? Because that too, that stress does affect your blood sugars. Sure does. Totally. So I saw perfectionism in my regular life, but then also in my diabetes. And about five to seven years ago, I just got really burnt out on keeping track of everything. And I realized how much mental space I was allotting to try to be perfect and realized that diabetes is more of an art than a science. You know, as much as they want to say, do this plus this equals this, it is, I've not found that in my life. Sammy or Dobie, have you found that? That is a great way to put it, Valerie. I got to hand it to you. It is an art and not a science. No, and and we talked about this too in our other other episodes. If listeners feel like going there, diabetic burnout, everybody has that. We're human. You know, you're right. You know, we're trying to be more perfectionism, but it's just, you're going to have an off day. Well, and I percent off days are so common. If you don't have them, I'd be concerned. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I found that I just said enough. I was just, I couldn't do it anymore and kind of gave up weighing myself every day, tracking everything. I was still taking my insulin and exercising, but I went to my diabetes doctor and I just said, I can't do this anymore. And she checked my A1C and it was exactly what it had been, you know, months before when I was still being perfect, quote unquote. And and I thought, wow, I found all this freedom in not being perfect and just accepting good enough. There is there is a good enough standard, I think, with diabetes management. Now, let me ask you this. Does the G word come in? And I'm talking about guilt. And I would think if you're perfection, oh, I, I didn't exercise today. I didn't eat as well as I should have. And I think that could be, to me, the downside of perfectionism, but I could be wrong. Yeah. You know, Now I get to exercise just for fun instead of feeling like Sammy was saying, oh, my blood sugar is high. I'm going to go out and walk for a couple hours or you can just enjoy life so much more. And the mental relief that I've found from that not being stressed all the time and is, is just incredible. I think it takes off a weight because a lot of times you just feel this constant need to like not even prove yourself, but like This is going to sound weird. I think when you get diagnosed, there's like a little bit of grit and thick skin that comes with it. And I think sometimes it turns into a wall of like, I'm determined, I'm this, and now I can't back down because I've proved myself to be strong and put up with it. And so being able to break down that wall and that barrier is really difficult. And it can almost feel like now you're keeping up this facade of like, no, I'm strong. I'm able to do it. I'm a perfectionist. I got it. I can always do it. I'm great. And then also when you allow yourself to be like vulnerable and be able to take a seat back, it's really refreshing to be like, I can be a human again. (laughs) Well, and when you're so right, Sammy, and when we're like that, we are much more relatable. 
And so people look to us and they go, oh yeah, I get that. I want to be that way. And when I was in my super perfectionist mode, people said that I was intimidating and they didn't, they were afraid to come talk to me because I had it all together and look at my life. And of course, this is before everybody knew the the broken facade that I was portraying. And um, But I found once I was really authentic and true about my struggles from with my being with my daughter and my ex-husband to to my diabetes it's so different now yeah it's almost like you realize like what really is important like you get your priorities of like okay i can be super strict and stern with this but that's not going to lead me to be healthy in every other aspect right the diabetes app is an online community platform that was created to help people living with diabetes find support and information in one spot. And on the diabetes app, you can join groups and connect with other people all over the world who are also living with diabetes. I mean, for me, whenever I have a bad day, I find myself scrolling through the mental wellness group just to reassure myself that I'm not alone. The diabetes app has a resource section where you can find articles, recipes, tips, and tricks for managing your diabetes. Download the diabetes app today and connect with us right on the app. DieStrong is an online telehealth platform that connects you to medical and holistic professionals to help you manage your diabetes. Find registered dietitians, nutritionists, certified diabetes educators, and more without the hassle of having to go into a doctor's office. Wait, 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 wait. You mean a lazy bum like me can have appointments right from my computer? Sign me up. That's right, Doby. And this week, our listeners can use promo code JMT25 for 25% off their first visit. Yeah, don't try to cheat and go to JMT26 because you're not going to get 26. It's 25. Go to www.diastronghealth.com. That's www.diastronghealth.com. All right. So, Miss Valerie, I hear that you have kind of talked just a little bit about your kidneys. Could you maybe kind of elaborate on that? So, I we heard you had the world's most dangerous kidneys. Absolutely. They are incredibly, yeah, you got to watch out for those. Volatile. Valerie's volatile kidneys, something like that. We're always about marketing here at JMT. So Sammy yeah. comes up with great things all the time. I got to yeah. catch up with her. But I this, I'm sorry, as you were saying, but we want to hear, this is a fascinating story. So I was diagnosed at 10 and, you know, struggling to kind of be perfect, get to 100 blood sugars. Going through life, I was a senior in college and they made me do this horrible kidney test where you collect all your urine for 24 hours in this ugly plastic kidney colored container. And, you know, I'm in college and I'm not going to carry around this container with me everywhere. So I didn't, I didn't really take it seriously, but my doctor kept saying, you need to repeat the test. And he finally said, this is serious. You need to really collect every specimen. So I did. And they said, well, uh, the results are concerning. We want to do a biopsy of your kidneys. And so they did that. And the results came back that I had diabetic kidney disease. So I'm thinking, I'm just about to graduate from college. I'm going to go out and change the world and do good and be this high performing professional. I'm going to get married and have kids and have my whole life ahead of me. And then I get this diagnosis. And I don't know if is Sammy, you wouldn't remember because you're too young, but there was a movie with Julia Roberts called Steel Magnolias. I know that movie. And that came out my senior year of college. So she is a diabetic in the movie and she eventually dies of kidney disease. And so I see this movie on the big screen thinking, this is my life. Am I going to even graduate and live beyond this? Yeah. And it really it really reaffirmed that I had to be perfect in diabetes and that I had now screwed up my whole entire life because I had not been perfect the previous 10, 11 years. So I just kind of managed, get through it, but really didn't have a lot of emotional support and wasn't at a place where I even knew to ask for emotional support around this. I was just trying to get my blood sugars in better better control and a couple of years later, my fiance at the time and I go to the doctor and she d- does some tests. This is a different doctor. And she says, your kidneys are functioning at 100%. And I said, what? Are you sure? She said, well, let me do the test again. She said, yeah, your kidneys are functioning at 100%. And I said, well, my biopsy samples that went to UCLA and they said I was probably functioning at like 35% and I was headed for a kidney transplant. And she said, I I don't know what to tell you. It's a miracle. 
So that allowed me to go on and actually have a baby boy. It was so awesome. It was incredible. Yeah. And I was actually at my doctor yesterday, just my general practitioner. And he said, well, it could have been that you had an autoimmune flare up at the time that you had that test. And I've never heard of this. You know, it was a lot of years ago that I was a senior in college and no one ever said you could have a flare up that would create this illusion of having diabetic kidney disease. Yeah. Wow. This is hard to comprehend. This is frightening. I mean, you you lived an interesting life to say the least. Yeah. Well, you know, when I was a kid, I thought there's nothing really interesting about me. And now as an adult, I said, I say, well, God must be laughing at me because I've had a lot of interesting stuff since those days when I said I have nothing interesting and exciting to share. Well, I was heard difficult childhoods make interesting adults. I've heard that because I had a difficult childhood. People say, man, your life is fascinating. It's like, well, I wish I could have been somebody else, but (laughs) you get the hands you get. Yes, absolutely. You got to play it and you've done it well. Thank you. No, it's true though. I mean, how did kind of do you feel like in your adult life, what do you think has been like the biggest struggle you'd say with dealing with still like perfectionism at times ever or no? Yeah, I think perfectionism has at times caused me just to not, acknowledge my feelings because I just had gotten into the doing mode of, okay, this is what I need to do to live. Like for me, exercise is a non-negotiable every day because I need it for my physical health, but I also need it for my mental health. So there's nothing I love more than walking my dog and listening to you guys on the podcast and laughing along Thank with you. you. So much. It makes me so happy because you guys are just so fun and funny, but also talking about things that we need to hear. I didn't have any diabetic friends and I actually didn't go to a diabetic camp till I was 45 years old. So I just have never had a community, which is why what you guys do and what other people are doing in having diabetic communities is so important because we just don't know if we don't have people to talk to about this stuff with. Yeah. Has your family kind of been, have they been pretty supportive and all of that or how has that been? Yeah. My parents have been so supportive all throughout my diabetes life and my life in general. And I'm really fortunate because in Santa Barbara, we have Sansom Research Clinic. So I've gotten to be a guinea pig actually since I was in college for... I was an early tester of the Dexcom and the Omnipod and getting to try cool new technology. And we've come quite a way from the time when I was pregnant with my son, where I was taking five shots a day and at least 10 blood sugars to now having an insulin pump that responds when you're going low or high. And I mean, I I don't know how, how do we live without Dexcoms? I mean, it's just I always say that. I'm like, that has saved me. Well, and you're a dancer. So I imagine that when you're going high or low and... Dobie, do you have I look over, I run to the side, I look at my (laughs) phone and I'm like, no. I can't, I can't like, dance at all, Valerie. That's uh, Dobie well, actually taught me all my moves. Yes, it's called the Big Booty Remix, we like to say around here. Sam and Elizabeth came up with that. But Dobie, I have a question for you. Do you have a continuous glucose monitor? Because your work is really demanding. It is. I, as a type 2, I do not. And I as I get back into the diabetes lifestyle, I did. I said, you know, I was almost a, as close to a perfectionist as I ever got in the first three months of diagnosis. I walked, I ate well, turned it around, got off the insulin. The doctor's like, hey, great, do what you got to do. And then I didn't maintain it. So those years, and then I got back at it again, like walking again, dropping the weight. So I, I think at some point I Get one. I feel like for me, it helps manage the things that feel like the X factor, like stress or adrenaline. And Got you plenty just, of that. Well, just listening to both of your careers, you know, I sit at a desk most of the day. So I don't have the physically demanding challenges, but I have been a public information officer working in emergency situations and just knowing, being able to see how the stress affects my blood sugar through my Dexcom has really helped me manage my diabetes better. Well, I so. also think what's tricky is um, sitting at a desk sometimes, like my numbers will go high and it's, you are dealing with physical stuff because then you're like, crap, <laughs> I can't move right now and I have to work. Like, and I'm standing at a standing desk or something. Yeah. And it can be kind of hard physically even because you're like, okay, I'd almost rather be moving around then now instead of not. I used to think the ideal job for a diabetic would be a postal delivery carrier because you're walking all day. <laughs> That's a great idea. It totally would be. But now that wouldn't work because most of them, at least in our area, are just, you know, in trucks and putting the mail in. Well, I have a question for you too. I know 
that shift for you, did you ever like, do you drink alcohol? Was that ever like a challenge for you kind of through college and whatnot? So I feel like that's a common one with type one that's kind of tricky and everybody handles it differently. And I like to hear how people handle it. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I grew up in a family where my parents didn't drink and I was so afraid of that X factor of alcohol and what it would do. So I I literally am the only person I know that didn't have a drink until she was 21. And I had one drink. I've never had more than one drink. And that has helped me kind of manage the impact. And the last time I have a drink, had a drink was in 2015, I didn't have any food and I got buzzed and I hated the feeling so much. And my friend had to explain to me, oh, you're buzzed. And I'm like, well, I hate this feeling. I'm never doing this again, which actually turned out to be okay because I am married to someone now that's in recovery. So... Oh, awesome. Wow. I would rather, you know, eat a piece of chocolate cake or have a Starbucks Frappuccino than have alcohol, you know, for the calories and the insulin needs. So... Oh, that's a buzz. Yeah, I, I totally get that, but... To me, it's kind of like, if you can't have fun without alcohol, then there's an issue. Yeah. If it makes you feel any better, Valerie, I I have never had a drink, ever. Wow, that's impressive. Never did, never smoked a joint, never did cocaine. Uh Yeah, I've never smoked uh, either, Dobie. Other problems. Good for you, Sammy. And again, I don't judge anybody. there's still time. He always says, there's still time, Sammy. (laughs) (laughs) On your birthday, it was funny. People have always tried to slip me alcohol because in my my comedians, most of them are imbibers, if not off the deep end. And they try to slip your vodka like I'm not going to taste it. It's like I could run my car on this stuff, not like I'm yes. not going to taste it. And again, I don't judge anybody, but I think moderation. You talk about the word stress that comes with with the 21st century, not just diabetes life. It's it's stress yeah. in general. So breathe a little bit. It does. It totally does. I mean, especially in the world we live in now. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's pretty tricky. I don't know. You're a very amazing woman, though. You have a lot of things you've been balancing. I'm impressed. Well, thank you. You know, we do the best we can and. We have to take our experiences and the lessons that we learn and it's what we do with them, not what happens to us that really creates the type of life that we have every day. So try to do my best. Yeah, I like that. I heard it. One of my, uh, well, actually my boyfriend's teacher was like, it's not about what you don't say. Or no, no, it's not about what you do say. It's about what you don't say. And I was like, mm. <laughs> I was like, mm, that one stuck with me. <laughs> Somebody else said that is famous. I don't know. I said it though, but how do you feel like like you as an author like when your book gets out that vibe comes through like you say you're a recovering a perfectionist they said your vibe attracts your tribe that's what we would do on the JMT you found us and we would surely appreciate that and uh, do you find you find other perfectionists that read your book and say oh thank goodness there's somebody like me that I can relate to well I think it helps people feel normal in that, oh, other people are feeling this way or struggling with this or going through this. And that's really why I wrote the book to help other people in tough situations to know that they're not alone. But yeah, I definitely have attracted more recovering perfectionists or people who want to recover from perfectionism into my life. And I love it. It's a joy to help other people. Well, that's true. I love that. And it's been... Amazing and so great. And yeah, I don't know. I'm just, I'm very amazed by you and have learned a lot. So thank you. It's been great to chat with you guys. Now, do you have another another project coming up? I mean, obviously life is always a thing in progress. Like, well, I wrote a book too. It's like, I did this. Now, when are you going to write another one? Well, do you know how hard it was to write the first one? People don't realize that. The first one I wrote during COVID and I had had two foot surgeries. So it was a great time where I really had to sit all uh, most of the time. But I'm working on a recovering perfectionist workbook and what that actually looks like. I'm not sure yet. Just kind of trying to be open to what's next. I'm not sure. I love that idea. I think, you know, until you guys brought it up, I never even thought about it. I had a grandmother that was a perfectionist and I I got good grades in school. I went down from an A plus to an A and my grandparents raised me. And I'll never forget, I looked at the report card and she looked at you went down in that subject. Not all the other A's. She didn't say anything about that. Yeah. So she was a perfectionist. I wish she was around because I'd, I'd make her buy your book uh, and read it. <laughs> it's been such a pleasure, Valerie. And thank you so much for coming on. Just as always, her time is sadly coming to a close. But you can find Valerie, you guys, at Valerie J. Cantella on Instagram and at ValerieCantella.com. So again, Valerie, thank you so much for coming on. And our question of the pod is, do you ever feel pressure to be perfect? <laughs> That's a great question. Which I think we obviously know that we all do. So you guys, if you could please answer and respond to that question of the pod, and you can find us on Instagram, 
Twitter and TikTok at just my type pod underscore Facebook at just my type pod and our hashtag just my type pod. But again, thank you so much, Valerie, for coming on. It's been such a pleasure and you are a very inspiring woman. Thank you so I have one much. more question, Valerie. What's your dog's name? If you're walking your dog and she's listening to this episode, is it he or she? It's a she, Charlie, and she's a yellow lab. So give her a shout out. Charlie, we love you. Thanks for listening. You and mom, we love you. Thanks for listening. We hope you're a healthy lifestyle. Keep her working. Keep her recovering from the perfectionism. Thank Queen Elizabeth, our pod squad producer, who always does a fantastic job. Yes. This is Zach, our intern. Thank you for listening. And Sammy, it is time to put the sugar-free cherry on the healthy Sunday one last time. Say lovey, baby. Oh. This is the Just My Type podcast.